All right, continuing with section 5.2, uh, we're talking about different methods for finding binomial probabilities. So the first one we talked about was using the formula. And then the second one we talked about was using technology. And I showed you the Excel formula, if you want to do this on Excel. So the third method is to use this table. Okay. So I have a link to the table here on my uh, PowerPoint, and I guess I'm gonna have to figure out how to put a link in a YouTube video. I've never done that before, all right? But if I, let's see, if I click on this table, it's gonna give me some warnings about, make sure I know what I'm clicking on. Okay, so we will look at that in uh, just a second. All right, so uh, this will give you a binomial probability for certain values of n and p. So I think the table only goes up to n equals 15. And then the values of p uh, go up in increments of like 0 0.05 or 0 0.10. So it doesn't have every single value of p and it doesn't have every single value of n, but it has you know, maybe the most common ones. Okay, so I'll show you how this works. Based on a Harris poll, 60% of adults believe in the devil. Assuming that we randomly select five adults, use the table to first find the probability that exactly three of the five adults believe in the devil. Okay? And then we'll come back to this other question uh, after we do that. Okay. Uh, so here they've pulled the section out of the table that we need. Uh, maybe I'll show you how to find this in the big table. So here's n equals five. All right, so each, uh, each of the randomly selected adults is a trial. We want to know the probability that exactly three of them uh, believe in El Diablo. So then uh, 0.6, because it said 60% uh, believe in the devil, that's one of the values of P that's in the table. So if I go down to uh, this row right here, this is the probability that X equals three, this 0.346. Okay. Uh, let's, let's find that in the big table real quick. So I'm going to exit out of this real quick. I'm going to pull this up. Uh, maybe I won't pull that up. Where did this open? I guess it opened over here. Okay. So here is n equals five. And then I go down to x equals three. And I just go across until I get to the column that has the 0 0.60 on top. So see that 0 0.346 there? That's the probability that I'm looking for. Okay. All right. <clears throat> then, let's see, the second question was, what's the probability that the number of adults who believe in the devil is at least two? All right, so there's one of those at least questions. So whenever it says uh, anything like at least or at most or fewer than or more than, <clears throat> you have to be careful to think about, okay, what numbers then are okay, all right? So for example, at least two means two or three or four or five, right? So it includes two, okay? If it said more than two, then I wouldn't include two, right? I would just say three or four or five. All right, so if you look at this same table, and maybe I'll just do it from here this time, we're looking for the probability that the number is at least two. So here's the probability it's exactly two, this 0 0.230. Here's the probability it's exactly three, probability it's exactly four, probability it's exactly five. Okay. So now you're just gonna add those four numbers together. This is a little faster than using the formula. So add those four numbers together, and I think I have that over here, 0 0.230 plus 0 0.346 plus 0.259 plus 0 0.078 comes out to 0.913, okay? Um, I wanna point out a way to do this that I think is a little faster than that even. Um, I would uh, maybe think about using the complement rule for this one. 
I'm going to be brave here and try to use my pen. Okay. Uh, so the other way you could do it is to say, okay, well, if it's not true that there are at least two, then that means there are less than two, right? There's only zero or one. So then uh, again, it's a little faster because instead of looking up uh, four numbers, you only have to look up two. It'll save you maybe about five seconds. All right. So if you do one minus the probability of zero minus the probability of one. Okay. Uh, going back to the table. <clears throat> Here's the probability of zero is 0 0.010. The probability of one is 0 0.077. If I add those two together, they add up to 0 0.087. And if I subtract that from one, I get the same answer. One minus point zero eight seven seven is 0.913. Yeah, okay, that's a funny looking nine. All right, so you have a couple different ways you can do that. All right, so that brings us to finding the mean and the standard deviation of a binomial random variable, okay? So it turns out that the mean of a binomial random variable, uh, we're, gonna, we're using the, no, the, yeah, the notation mu and sigma. All right, these are parameters. You think of these things as populations, okay? Uh, the mean, uh, you just do n times p, and I think that makes a lot of sense. If you think back to the pop quiz example we did on Thursday, we took a pop quiz that had 10 questions. Everybody guessed on every question, so there's a 25% chance of getting each question right. It wouldn't surprise me if the average score was two and a half out of 10, okay? Because on average, especially in a great big class, uh, people are gonna get 25% of the questions right. So 25% of 10 is 2.5. So I think that one is, uh, you know, pretty logical. This one I'm not going to try to explain, all right? Uh, I'm not sure I'd remember how. So remember the variance of a population is called sigma squared. And it turns out for a binomial random variable that is n times p times q. And then as usual, the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Okay, and then this is something we've seen a number of times. Uh, significantly low values are any values that are more than two standard deviations below the mean. Significantly high values are at least two standard deviations above the mean. And then values not significant, I prefer to say not unusual, are anything within two standard deviations of the mean. Okay. I feel like we've seen this at least two or three times before. Okay. So, Previous example involved uh, 460 overtime wins in, in NFL football games. We did this example at the very end of the part one video. Uh, P is 0.5 and Q is 0.5. That's assuming that winning the overtime coin toss does not provide an advantage. Okay, so if you win the overtime coin toss, there's still a 50-50 chance you'll win the game. Okay, so they want me to find the mean and the standard deviation for the number of wins <clears throat> out of 460 games. And then, since we'll have the standard deviation at that point, we can use the range rule of thumb to find the values separating the numbers of wins that are significantly low or significantly high. Okay. So in other words, any number of wins below blank is significantly low. Any number of wins above blank is significantly high. All right, and then we'll be able to answer, is the result of 252 overtime wins uh, significantly high? Okay. 
My guess is that it will be because in the previous example, we found that the probability of getting 252 wins or more was only about two and a quarter percent. Okay. So we say that anything that has less than a 5% chance of happening is unusual, right? Okay. So when you plug in N equals 460, P equals 0.5 to start with, uh, you get that mu is N times P, which is 460 times 0.5, that's 230 games, okay? So the average number of games won would be 230. That makes sense, half of the 460. And then the standard deviation would be the square root of N times P times Q. The square root of 460 times 0.5 times 0.5 is about 10.7 games. So the average number of games won is 230. The standard deviation is 10.7. Okay. okay, so letter B, uh, remember they were asking uh, what are the cutoff points for significantly low and significantly high? All right, so now we found that uh, the mean is 230 games and the standard deviation is 10.7. So two standard deviations below the mean would be 230 minus two times 10.7, and that comes out to 208.6. So any number of games less than that would be considered significantly low. Okay. And then significantly high would be 230 plus two times 10.7, and that comes out to 251.4. Oops. Okay, so then the last question was, is 252 games significantly high? Yes, it is, just barely, because it's greater than 251.4. That is the cutoff for significantly high. Okay, this is something we've seen before, a couple times, I think. Uh, X successes is significantly high if the probability of getting that many or more is 0.05 or less. So we've now done an example of that. Uh, at the end of the part one video, we found that the probability of 252 or more successes was only about two and a quarter percent. So that's another way of figuring out that that number is significantly high because that probability is less than uh, 0.05, okay? Uh, and then similar kind of thing for significantly low. If the probability of X or fewer successes is 0.05 or less, then that number would be considered significantly low. 